Hello everybody and welcome to Now Loading. We're doing a special thing today, as you can see, because I'm speaking in English. And this is our first episode ever in English. And why? Because the Savage Con has officially started. And for those of you that don't know what that is, uh, it's a, a Spanish uh, online convention uh, centered on Savage Worlds, the role-playing game. Uh, so because of it, we have invited Mr. Shane Lacey Hensley, co-creator of the game and co-founder of Pinnacle Entertainment Group, for this interview. Welcome to Now Loading, Shane, and to the Savage Con, and thanks for being here with us. Buenos dias, amigos. <laughs> we also have Oscar Estefania with us today. He is uh, one of the Savage Con organizers. Hello, Oscar Estefania. Good evening, guys. And I'm Seregras, which is really different to pronounce, but you can call me Isma if it's easier. So let's begin with this uh, interview. And Oscar, let's start with the questions. And first of all, it's an honor uh, to have you here. Uh, um, we'll take advantage of that. We'll start right away with uh, uh, some juicy questions. So um, first of all, how uh, uh, entertainment, how is how is it structured and how was the company born? How has it evolved through the years? So um, I was freelance writing for a bunch of companies like TSR, FASA, West End Games, White Wolf, and even a computer game company called SSI. And um, I started, uh, I was doing a lot of work for all of those different companies. And I had some ideas of my own, and I decided to create something called Pinnacle Entertainment Group. And I called it Group because several of my friends had ideas that they wanted to publish as well. So the first thing we actually published was a collectible card game called The Last Crusade that was uh, created by my friend John Hoppler. And then the first product that I wrote and published was called Fields of Honor, which is a historical miniatures game tool for 19th century warfare. So um, then later on, we created Deadlands, and that's when things really kind of took off and, and got big. And then, of course, eventually Savage Worlds. So we've gone through a couple of different organizational structures through the years. We've been partners with other companies. We've had uh, big offices with lots of employees back in the uh, early night or late 90s. Uh, these days, we're all virtual, so we're all spread out all, all over the world. I work at home. Jody Black is a full-time employee. She works from, from her house in North Carolina. Erin Acevedo is our art director who lives in New York. And all of our authors and artists work and live all over the world. Thank you. That's that's great. And how do you how do you work with other licensees like both in the US and, and abroad? What what's the what's the philosophy behind the Savage Worlds fan? Um, and well, the license and the fine license too. Sure. So um, we knew, you know, most people are, if you're going to play fantasy, most people right now will be playing Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, right? Great, great games. We love them too. We want to be the game that you immediately go to for everything else. If you like, you know, this kind of game like Savage Worlds is. So one of our goals right from the start was to make sure that uh, Savage Worlds was ubiquitous. It was everywhere, right? Both um, in terms of its language and in terms of the setting and the rules itself. So when we created our license, it's not an open gaming license like D20 did a few years ago. Uh, I guess a few decades ago at this point. It's a, it's a license that we grant to people because we think their work is good enough that our fans will be happy with their work. Um, so that's what our our license is, and if you're going to sell it, we uh, we have to approve it and give you the official license. If you're not going to sell it, like if you just want to write an adventure for Savage Worlds and put it on your website, that's the fan license, and we don't charge for that, and we don't approve that. Then there's the translation partners that we have. In Spain, it's HT Publishers, for example, right? And we allow them, we allow each of our licensees in each country to monitor and do the same uh, fan or official license with third party companies there. Does that make sense? Yes. So they serve the same role in their particular country as we do here. If it's if someone's going to charge for it, they will take a look at their original material and, and make them subject to whatever guidelines they've set in place for their country. 
we don't do any sort of um, follow-up or policing on our licensees. Once we give you the license, we trust you. And so far, we've not had any issues with that. But of course, if we get a lot of feedback from fans, for example, that a company is producing poor material or you know they don't feel like it's worth their money, then we'll talk to the licensee and try to get things fixed and straightened out. Because what we want at the end of the day is a ton of material for a Savage Worlds fan to be able to look look through and feel that it has at least a minimum quality level, right? Back during the D20 days, there might be 50 different books on dwarves, right? And how would you tell the difference between the good ones and the bad ones? You know, you'd have to look up reviews, maybe buy a few. We would just want to make sure that the library for Savage Worlds is 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 of a, at least a minimum level of quality. And so far, I think we've done that. Our licensees have made some incredible stuff that, that we're really proud of and, and play ourselves. It's a great philosophy, I think. I, I think it's, it's great. great. So, so um, um, you talk you about, about the uh, original um, philosopher for, for Savage Worlds um, that was uh, a few years ago. So how uh, do you see the game's evolution uh, in an um, RPG world where there's an ever-growing offer and everything appears and then fades away um, really quickly? Right. So we are, um, I think we're 15 years old this year. So we've, we've actually been around a while. I still feel like we're the new kid on the block for Savage Worlds. Not me so much, but, but the game. Um, And I'm really excited about Savage Worlds Black because I think what we've we've done, and you've seen it with some of the additions we've made to the game in recent years that we released for free on our website. Um, one of the things I really like is we still have our crunchy simulation simulationist roots, but we've embraced some narrative aspects for parts of the games. Uh, so maybe at first you saw it for interludes, for example and then maybe more recently in quick combat and in savage worlds black i think you'll see a little bit more of that eking in so that uh as you play your game whatever setting it is you know there are some scenes in movies and books and things that are hard to to simulate in a game for example when the hobbits go to mordor in lord of the rings right there's that long brutal trek through the wilderness up the mountains through the snow How do you do that in a game, right? I mean, it's just a bunch of fatigue rolls, bigger rolls, something like that. That's kind of boring. So how do you make that exciting? Our first step was with interludes. So at least you have something to talk about on the way. You get to get into your character. You get to tell a little bit of your backstory and, uh, and add something to, you know, what would otherwise just be a bunch of die rolls. So that same kind of philosophy has started to appear in some of the other subsystems of the game. And uh, that's what I think you'll see some of in Savage Worlds Black. But what's also important to me is when you want to have that big, fun, detailed, crunchy combat, that stays the same, right? I've had so many wonderful experiences doing that. And you know, one of my favorite that I talk about sometimes, we were playing a Weird Wars Rome game at Genghis Khan in Denver, Colorado. And it's a convention game and it's kind of loud in there. and but And, we, and you have a, a certain amount of time, right? Everyone was really into their character and having a great time. And there came this moment when we were surrounded by these serpent men and it was getting really, uh, really scary. And our characters formed up. We were legionnaires, right? We had our tower shields and we each had the, the edge that, that gives you an extra point of parry if you have a guy on either side of you, the shield wall edge. And we gamed it out, and it was really crunchy. And what was great was it was dangerous, right? There was a real risk we, would, we were going to fail. So we had to pull out every little rule we knew to try to stay alive and make it work. And it was, it was a blast. And I love having that crunchy layer underneath the storytelling part. So, and I, I guess this is why, because it makes the danger real. You know, we absolutely might have failed and died. That's why I don't like something like challenge ratings from Dungeons and Dragons, which, you know, 3.0, which I totally get and it makes sense in that game. But I prefer a game where here's this terrible situation. What would you like to do about it? And then you decide and you might fail. 
And you might have to live with that and deal with it. And I think that's an interesting story as well. Yeah, that's true. Well, <clears throat> I suppose I suppose you've heard, but Spain Spain has a very um, active uh, Savage Worlds community. Uh, people's creating a lot of new material, both fan made and 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 professionally published. Um, and we have a lot of people always um, well always active in the internet and 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 uh, creating content about Savage Worlds. What is what is uh, Pinnacle's view on on other savage savage worlds communities around the world and and, and about Spain? Yeah, we're we're actually super excited every time we we hear what comes out of a different culture, right? Because different cultures have different ideas of what's cool and heroic, and they also game differently as well. Um, I was in Italy a couple of years ago with uh, Jolly Troll, which is our licensee there. And the in America, when we run demos at conventions, it tends to be about a four hour game slot. But in Italy, you sit down and you're supposed to run people through a game in about 30 minutes. So I had written a brand new scenario that I thought would be fun for Deadlands. I get into Italy and I start running the game and they come over and they're looking at me kind of strangely. And I'm like, something wrong? <laughs> they said, the, uh, the game is supposed to be about 30 minutes. And I'm like, oh. So I very quickly had to figure out how to you know, tell a cool story and engage everybody and give them a moment. And that's where quick combat came from, because I didn't have time to game out the little fights. And that particular adventure is uh, you're going through the desert to Tombstone and I just need to beat you up for a while before the big finale. So each of those combats aren't really important other than to make you take some fatigue, take some wounds, and use up your ammo. It's kind of a resource management thing, right? So quick combat came from that, allowed me to do so, and that came directly from playing in Italy where gaming styles are very different. I got to play in Australia one time where they really don't care, in my experience, about the rules so much. They care about the backstory of the character. So the back of the character sheet where the story is is what's important to them. Uh, I got to play a neutered kobold <laughs> in one of the games there. Um, so, you know, one of the, the barriers we have with uh, how many countries Savage Worlds is in, we're in Russia and uh, Hungary and Spain and Italy and France and Germany and South Korea and Brazil. But, you know, I, I, I speak a little bit of a lot of languages, but I don't speak a lot of any language other than, than Russian. So uh, I don't I don't get to read all of this excellent stuff that's coming out of there. So sometimes I'll have my friends who, who are native speakers go and tell me what's out there and what people are doing with it. And I'm just constantly amazed. I, I would love to know more about what's going on in Spain. So maybe after our talk, you can tell me a little bit about what some of you guys have seen, or you can do so now if you think your listeners would be interested. What have you seen? We'll try that after yeah, after the questions. Okay. Yeah, we can try that after the questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, in fact, uh, next question is is related to this. Um, so, as you said, uh, I think not only in Spain but uh, pretty much everywhere else in the world, uh, every savage fan is always uh, thinking of writing or or publishing or uh, making something savage. So uh, what steps uh, should follow a, a Spanish uh, writer uh, who has uh, published a fan-made uh, savage setting in Spain to get her his or her book uh, published in, in English? So to get it published in English, well, let's start, let's start at the very beginning. The first thing you should do if you're going to write for any company is play the game a lot. Run the game, play the game, right? You really have to know it. And Savage Worlds is... Um, is more complex beneath the surface than it is on the surface. So, you know, on the surface, you roll a die and a wild die, you need a four or better to succeed, right? But where the real, where the real work for us comes in is making sure that all the edges and hindrances and rules that make all that fit together are clear, easy, and fun. We will often see new writers really try to make super detailed subsystems 
uh, to simulate, you know, a different game or a different mechanic that would break the flow of gameplay for everyone else at the table, right? If it's going to take you three minutes to figure out how this skill works while everyone else is, you know, waiting for their turn, that's that's not a good idea. Things like that, right? If there's too much math involved back and forth, that's not a good idea. So play the game and learn learn how to to dig into the mechanics and understand it. That's step one. The second step is write a one sheet. Write something that can be published and edited and commented on by others. And if you're a Spanish uh, speaker, for example, I would do that through HT Publishers first, right? Get feedback from someone who's who's got a professional editor and a professional eye for that kind of work. And then uh, most of our translation partners often work with us to publish things in English, right? So they'll say, hey, we've got this great adventure in, uh, in Spanish. You know, it's this cool dungeon crawl or whatever, and uh, we're interested in having it done in English. And then how we handle those efficiently, officially is a little bit different depending on um, who we're working with and what it's intended for. So for example, sorry, this is getting a little complicated, but you asked you ask a business question. Um, if you are writing something for your own original world, like an adventure or something, right? That's pretty easy because we can just put you under our standard licensee agreement. We'll have, you'll talk to our, our guy who's in charge of that, Danny Walsh, and he'll say, yep, this looks professional to me. And you know, if you get art and trade dress and make it something worthwhile to the fans, we'll approve you as a licensee, and then you can publish it on your own. If you're trying to write something for us, like a Deadlands adventure or a 50 Fathoms adventure, that's a little different because that has to be a contract from us to you and we'll sell it, right? You'll just write it, we'll do everything else. If you're trying to get your setting published as its own book, then it would be the same as doing an adventure. You, you know, you'd write it, write at least enough of it to get our approval, and then you can go publish it on your own. If you're trying to make it a pinnacle product, it's probably just not going to happen. We have a backlog of about three years worth of material we're trying to get out ourselves. So it's hard for us to take somebody's setting and you know, make something new with it. But people inquire all the time and there's certainly been some occasions where we've done so, right? Um, and then probably my last bit of advice is we see this a lot where uh, somebody who's a big fan, he's written a couple of one sheets. We've gotten to know them. We like their work. We think they have a, a similar mindset as us for the mechanics, but their, um, their English language skills aren't quite up to par for the actual translation, for the actual writing. So if you have a friend who is a native speaker of both languages or really strong in both languages, get them to edit it first. That will help both parties tremendously. Good advice. Thank you, Shane. Uh, sure. That would be really helpful for, for the rest of the fans, for the Spanish ones, too. So are there any official guidelines to, <coughs> sorry, to create house rules, uh, like Savage Words house rules, but without breaking the game, like for keeping the, the, uh, the game intact? Well, not intact, but not break it too much. There, there's no official guidelines for that. I mean, you need to do what's best for your group. There are a few things that I've seen through the years that I question or that I would not do. For example, um, one of our licensees has a rule where extras can't ace on damage. I think that's a big mistake. It would be not too difficult to make your character immune to some of those guys. Right. And I think, I think, that takes the danger out of the game and the danger from hordes, mooks, extras, minions, whatever you want to call them, is a, is a very real part of the game that I, I would not recommend that you change. Um, there's another one that I'll, I'll let, let your viewers decide. I'll give you um, my take on it. One of my very good friends who runs some of the best Savage Worlds games that I've played in is a guy named Ron. And Ron has a rule that you can never have more than five bennies. Okay. So, and he also has, well, okay, I'll do that one next. Um, I'm torn on that one because on the one hand, it makes your bennies very precious. On the other hand, 
you often have five bennies and you do something really cool and that instant reward mechanic isn't there for you, right? So I'm torn on that one. Then there's some interesting ones that I think are great for a personal game, but I wouldn't publish. So for example, uh, example, the same guy, Ron, has this fun rule where once per game, you can roll a D30. You, 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 and you, uh, you use it in place of a skill roll, for example, right? So he carries around his big D30, and you know, once per game, he gets rolled. So we were playing a, um, a Rippers game, and, it's, uh, and my character had to do something really important, and I decided it was time to roll the D30, so I rolled it. I actually rolled a 30 and then a 17, right? So that was awesome. Another guy's big moment came, and he rolled a one. <laughs> so the fact that it wasn't additive, for example, is a little weird. And publishing it would make it really hard for us to, you know, that, that just changes the scale so much that if you're publishing something, the rules have to be pretty firm. If it's, a, if it's something you do in your house game, you can you can fudge it. You can um, make it up as you go, right? And work with your players and kind of work it out. You don't have to have it in a, a strict written column in a book somewhere. So, I guess if I to come back around to your original question, official guidelines for house rules. You know, it's your game, it's your rules, it's your group. You know how they play. Just realize that might not work outside of that group for a published adventure or even at a convention. <coughs> Sorry, nice. I, I like to roll a d30 sometimes too <laughs> in the game of Savage Wars. It was um, fun. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, let's get into some uh, um, specific questions about the uh, uh, Pinnacle and upcoming uh, uh, products and news and, and uh, all that stuff. Okay, so sure. you can say no <laughs> when, whenever you want. Uh, and, and I think the first one is, is obvious, is um, what can you tell us about the, the Black Edition and as far as it can be discussed uh, right now? Okay, so what I can tell you is it won't be $10. <laughs> I don't know what the <laughs> core rule book is in Spain. What is, the, what is the price of the core rule book in Spain? Is it a, I think it's about a, $10 equivalent? Or? No, it's a 20 euros. Okay, so yeah. it won't change for you. It'll, it'll be about the same. <laughs> um, it will be very similar to the current game. It's not a complete rewrite or anything like that. We definitely have changed some skills. Um, a lot of that was in Flash Gordon, if you saw uh, what we changed there. So, for example, athletics is now in and will take the place of climbing, swimming, and throwing. Uh, when we change something like that, you know, we put a lot of thought into it for two reasons. One is we want it to be as compatible as possible with previous products, right? We don't want to just change things um, easily be because it will mess up previous books and, and other people's works. But the other problem we have, athletics is a really good example where I really have to think hard about it because the original skill list was created as it was for a particular reason. So we make a lot of historical games, right? And throughout most of history, people couldn't swim. Even sailors on a boat couldn't swim, right? So unless you lived on the coast in Spain, for example, you probably could not swim. So it was important to me at the time that swimming be a skill that you had to put points into, okay? So that's why it stayed that way for a long time. But as, as we did many more genres, and as we thought about the heroic trope of being athletic, all of those guys and gals in movies, books, cartoons, fiction, et cetera, they, they can swim, right? They may not be particularly good at it, but they can swim. So I finally relented and said, okay, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make it part of it because it is kind of weird and people don't take it unless they know they're gonna be on a boat. But that's the kind of thought process that goes into every single change that we make right so it, it's it's really a little bit more complicated than some people um, may talk about on the internet swimming is so specific why is that there versus something else right well that's why because in a lot of settings when you fall off a boat it's dangerous 
right? Now, if everybody just has athletics, it's not as dangerous. So that, that's what we think about. So what else in the game? Um, tricks and tests of will, I think, have been very weak for a long time. And uh, Flash Gordon made them definitely better. And there is some really cool stuff in Savage Worlds Black that's going to make them even better. Why is that important? Because it's important to me that people don't just, their turn comes up, I try to hit the orc with my sword, I try to hit the orc with my sword, same thing over and over and over, right? I want people to do clever, cool things, and I want them to feel like it pays off in the game. So I want the reward for those actions to be uh, you know, equal to, the, to you passing up a turn that, where you might whack, you know, whack the bad guy. Bennies are a part of that. You know, GM should be rewarding those things, but the game mechanics needed to reflect it better as well. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup in edges, hindrances, and combat options. Like suppressive fire, I think, is, is terrible in our game right now, and it should be great because we have a lot of military-style games. I was in the Army. You know, it should be better. So I think what we have now is much better. That's one of the things I'm still testing, so we'll see. Um, We've cleaned up. So well, I guess one of the first things people ask about is chases. And I have a pretty big change to chases that I think is cooler, funner, faster. I think it's what people are looking for, but it takes a lot of testing, right? Because our chases aren't just car chases. They're not just dog fights. They're foot chases through a crowded city doing parkour. They're spaceship dogfights. They're chasing a hansom cab with a pack of werewolves in rippers. They're a bunch of uh, guys in a posse in Deadlands hunting down a Los Diablos, right? And it needs to fit all of those things as much as possible. And I, I think people are going to like it, but it's, it's got a few more iterations to go through. That's the kind of stuff that we're working on. And of course, uh, you know, more updated trade dress and graphics and better layout, better organization. Um, there's a big change to the encumbrance rules. Silly little stuff like that. You know, most people right now don't even use the encumbrance rules. And, and I think that's good, but occasionally it's important. So we just made that simpler. Things like that. Okay, so let me get this straight. Sorry. Uh, I, I don't know about uh, everyone else, but I got the. Uh, feeling that uh, most of the new rules and changes for uh, black were almost also uh, sorry were uh, already presented in flash gordon so it's that's not true i guess i wouldn't say most i would say mm -hmm. some of the important ones okay okay thank you and uh, is there any estimated publishing date it's too too soon i guess i wish <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, Okay, I won't I'm, bastard you anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're, we're a middle-sized company, which means we should be releasing products on time. But what on time means to us is once we have set a date, then we, we usually hit that date. But we don't set a date until we're really sure that it's closed. Mm -hmm. And with Savage Worlds Black, it's just so important to everything we do that I, I can't set that date until I, I feel really good about it. Right? And uh, I'm... I would estimate that I'm about 80% there right now. Mm -hmm. But because we're all spread out, it's hard to play test uh, with the people that I want to play test with most, like Clint Black. So, uh, you know, that makes it a little bit, it's a little bit tricky, but, but we're managing. And um, I mean, everybody's waiting on me, so I'm doing my best. <laughs> well, if you need any Spanish play testers, we just let us know. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> by the way, Thank you about the info about um, uh, regarding the chases because my group has mm -hmm. been behind that one for a long time uh, asking me for a change about that one. Uh, yeah. Thank you about that info. <laughs> They'll be really happy. Um, what are the upcoming um, Savage Worlds settings releases uh, by Pinnacle? Great. So um, the big one for us right now is still Flash Gordon. We already ran the Kickstarter for it, of course. We're waiting for the books to get in from overseas, and then we'll do the big retail release. Um, that has not been translated into Spanish, uh, so you'll you'll want to get that one in English, and it probably won't be because of the relationship with uh, Licensor. Um, the other stuff that's uh, coming is we did a book for Lankmar called The Savage Seas of Nawan. Uh, that's going to be a, a small Kickstarter that we're going to do next. 
and that'll put uh, that back out. Plus, we never actually did a Kickstarter for Lankmar, for those who know that setting, for its library setting. Uh, so that's our next one. After that, we have a new setting for the last Parsec called Iron Gate. It's a prison planet kind of thing. It's really cool. Daryl Hardy wrote it. I'm very excited about that. And then what else have we talked about? Uh, the new edition of Deadlands is being worked on. Uh, I don't have a release date for it either, but it will be sometime later this year. We're also putting Deadlands Hell on Earth and Deadlands Noir into the new graphic novel format that we do now. That'll come probably over the next 18 months. And then one that I'm pretty excited about that we soft announced. So we talked about it at a, uh, at a speech at Gen Con, but we haven't put anything out officially. John Goff is working on Deadlands Dark Ages. Wow. So we're pretty excited about that. Well, you just killed uh, our three next questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do now? <laughs> uh, you uh, asked I, my... I have... You can ask my question if you, if you the, the last one, uh, Oscar. Then <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Ask it. I, I have another one for him. So <laughs> no, I just wanted to ask about. Uh, I, I, uh, I think I saw. Um, um, I, I don't. It was a tweet by John Goff, precisely about uh, uh, Dark Ages. Um, and can we know? <laughs> something else about what the book will be about so it's uh it's uh i think it's dark ages before uh 10th century i guess uh and uh, uh yes so it's um it's actually the era of arthur and morgana and the cackler if you've read the cackler graphic novel that i wrote mm -hmm. and um I don't know what else I can say about it at this point, but it, it is, it winds up being kind of the roots of the reckoning and all the stuff that happens in Deadlands later on. And uh, it's pretty cool. And we're going, we're going pretty dark with this one. You know, it's got a really, it's not knights in shining armor kind of stuff, right? I mean, it is, it's truly dark ages. It's, it's pretty, pretty grim and, and, and fairly horrific. And uh, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a, I think people are going to like it. Plus, John Goff is a twisted <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, are there any plans to launch uh, new uh, products for uh, Showdown? For Showdown, great question. Uh, I want to get Savage Worlds Black done, and I want to get Deadlands done because we have a. a we have a lot of stuff happening with Deadlands um, that we'll announce pretty soon. But you know, broadly, we've you know we've been working with Hollywood for years to try to get something to happen there, and I don't know, things have have looked pretty good for a while. You know, the the entertainment medium, t television and movies, has grown so much that they're really content hungry now, right? They're always looking for something new, and we've had uh, we've had more movement there than we have in a while. But with, with Deadlands being out of print, it's kind of tough for us to send them stuff or to get them excited, right? So we, we've, that, that's a big priority for us. There are also some board and card games in the works for those things. So um, and we'll announce those when we get a little, uh, a little closer. But that's kind of why our focus is so heavy on just Deadlands itself right now. What was the original question? <laughs> Uh, showdown. <laughs> showdown. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so um, with uh, with some board games that we have in mind, we're trying to think about would we like to bring back the Great Rail Wars, for example? And if we did the Great Rail Wars, that would essentially be Showdown, right? Um, showdown itself is so tricky, though, because there's so many genres to handle, right? And um, you know, the question is, would it be better to really scale things down and make a almost a new game so that it plays better just as a straight miniature game, or is it better to make it compatible with Savage Worlds? And that's where we, we wrestle a little bit. Uh, so I don't have a real answer for you just yet. That's, that's where... That's where the trouble has, has been the last few years as we've looked at returning to it. Um, 
So yeah, that, that's the best answer I have for you right now. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't know if uh, the the comment about uh, Dark Ages uh, cancels this question, but uh, some time ago, uh, some people uh, included heard uh, something about the Weird Wars uh, Crusades. Uh, is that a, uh, is there any truth to that, or is it just uh, a I want dream? to do it. I I ran it at a couple of conventions about eight or nine years ago. Uh, we have the premise is all set up. The idea behind it is all set up. And I'm happy to tell you what it is. Um, there is a hell hole in the Holy Land and things are coming out of it. Okay. And both the uh, the Saracens or Arabs and the English and, and Franks and so forth, Crusaders and the, the Saracens, have to work together to stop it. And of course, that's what the uh, the Twilight Legion is trying to do right they're trying to seal up the he the hell hole and stop all this evil from getting into the world while the crusades themselves continue to happen with all those who aren't in the know who are still killing each other for religious reasons and so forth obviously the crusades is one of those eras that you know we have to be pretty careful about you know we don't want to stir up any more trouble than there already is these days but you know we think the way the Twilight Legion is set up, it's just like we did with World War II and especially World War I and Vietnam. You can play people from any side of a conflict. Once they know there's a bigger threat out there, they can join, join the Twilight Legion to fight it, right? So that's why we would very much want... The way we like for Weird Wars to start is your, your soldiers, it's the typical, it's the historical war, and you do some of that first, and you get a taste for what the Crusades or world war one or whatever was about but then once you learn there's supernatural monsters in the world then you join the twilight legion and you you join together and you fight that right so christians and muslims can then fight side by side against the greater threat so um, i don't currently have a writer for it but i suspect that as soon as i find a good writer for it we'll go ahead and commission it and then that'll probably one of our next two or three weird wars releases which we tend to do every couple of years now that's great news. I love the Crusades. I'm a, my master's is in history, and Crusades is kind of one of my, uh, one of my, my, my loves. So I've got a, a bookshelf full of Crusades books back there. So I, I really want to play it. That's great. Um, <clears throat> I have a, one extra question about one of my favorite settings. It's the one I use to introduce people to Savage Worlds. And for me, it's, it, it's a gem of a setting. It's, it's, it's incredible. I, I love it a lot. And it's Evernight. And I'd like to ask you, will we ever see a new edition of Evernight? Uh, there is a guy working on it now. He is, he's a new author for us. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say if it's going to come in ready to go yet, right? He's a, he's a really bright guy, and I really like him. But... I haven't read it, so I don't know if it's going to match my vision of it. And I know he's going to start with turning the first one into more of a what we call now a plot point campaign rather than a linear adventure. But um, as soon as we get Deadlands out this year and revise the Companions, which we'll also need to do, um, Evernight is, is one of the big ones that I would love to return to. And it was always set up to be... Uh, after you do the first one to go to different regions as well, like the, the Japanese flavored one or, you know, whatever. So, yeah, I love Evernight. Do you know how Evernight got started? Do you know how? the story there? No, no, I don't. Okay. So when uh, D20 came out, right, the, the Dungeons and Dragons, everybody was going to move to D20. Um, hang on one second. My computer's messing up here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, so we wanted to test D20 and see how we play and learn the rules and decide if we were going to uh, to move to D20 ourselves. So we played, I ran actually, the trilogy of trilogies. So there was the, the Beholder trilogy, the Sahagan trilogy, and the, uh, the Illithid trilogy, the Mind Flayers, right? And at the end of the Mind Flayer adventure, uh, you you meet the Overmind, which is this, is this the, yes, the Mind Flayer one. And uh, you meet the big 
overmind the big boss kind of critter, and you're supposed to uh, threaten it, interrogate it, and learn how to stop the invasion, right? Because the Elithids are going to come in, cast the world in eternal darkness, and enslave humanity, right? Or and, and, and civilization. Um, so my group goes in, and I, uh, I, you know, talking for the overmind, and I say, "Stop! What are you doing?" And they go, I, we just kill it. I'm like, it says, wait, I can tell you. No, we just kill it. So they killed the thing, right? And I'm just sitting there going, uh, okay, well, you didn't stop the invasion. So the Illithid in, do indeed come from their, their planet, plane. And uh, the world is cast in a thousand years of darkness and you're all enslaved. And everyone is like, oh. And then just, there's this pause, right? And then they go, we want to play that. And that's where Evernight came from. Okay, that's great to know. <laughs> Oscar, do you have any, any more questions? I can think of anyone right now. I think <laughs> we we got a lot of info from Shane today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think there are really lots and lots of Savage fans uh, really happy to hear lots of things that we're saying here today. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever we ask, they're never going to be happy. So that's a thing that we know for sure. Yeah. So uh, they will keep asking for more. Yeah. 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 So we're going to uh, end uh, the interview here. Um, we're going to, uh, we'd like to thank you a lot, Shane, for taking time to be here with us and answering our, our questions, the questions of the Sa uh, Savage World Spanish community. Thank you very much for being here, uh, Shane. Thank you, and, and say thanks to Jody and all the other guys who helped a lot also by, by mail. Will do. Bueno. <laughs> <laughs> Adios. And to all the viewers, SavageCon is starting right now. Uh, be prepared because there are, are going to be a lot of online games, uh, interviews like this one, a lot of content. Just stay tuned, and uh, you're going to enjoy the content. See you all. Awesome. Okay. Great job, guys. Well, that was uh, really interesting.